Let me first start with a few little data points to add to those that Andrew has already addressed. Currently, our fossil fueled economy largely is responsible for contributing nearly 55 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per annum into our atmosphere. That's an all-time record bar only the setback that was the 4 billion tonnes less as a result of COVID lockdowns around the world. How do you imagine 55 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents? Well, the first thing is the equivalent of about 600 active medium-sized volcanoes. How might we think about what we've done relative to historical times? Well, we have contributed as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as has not been seen for 80 million years. And indeed, one of the challenges is that our climate scientists say that in the last 300 million years, planetary temperatures have oscillated between minus, minus 4 degrees and plus 2 degrees from where they are today. 300 million years of relatively stable planetary temperature. With the carbon dioxide and its equivalent gases emitted into the atmosphere, we are on track not only to add the 1.1 degree of global warming since pre-industrial revolution times, but to surge past 1.5 and past the milestone of 2 degrees, unless we take decisive action. That decisive action requires us to reduce globally our gross emissions by nearly a half by 2030 to have some prospect of being in the zone of the one and a half to two degree target. Let me for a moment reflect on the risks that global warming poses. The Ministry for the Environment published New Zealand's first national risk assessment. If you haven't read it, read it. It identifies 43 risks, which it groups together in five categories, and then picks two priorities in each of those categories. And of interest to this particular forum will be things like the threat and risk to drinking water, the threat to the built environment from more violent climate, a wetter, windier, as well as warmer and drier world. The National Risk Assessment is a backdrop to the work the Climate Change Commission is tasked to do. The Commission is not all things climate change. The Commission is responsible for providing advice, it has no regulatory powers, to the government of the day and monitoring performance and outcomes. Our first stream of advice is to consider what emissions New Zealand should make if it is to be on track to meet its statutory targets and international obligations. Let for a moment remind ourselves of what those statutory targets are. It is that we should reduce our biogenic methane emissions by between 24 and 47 per cent by 2050. And that in respect of all other greenhouse gases, we should be at net zero. That is, all our gross emissions should be offset by removals. And our international obligations under the Paris Agreement are essentially that for this decade, we will contribute no more than 601 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions net of any removals that we make largely from afforestation. The question for the Commission is what are the budgets for greenhouse gas equivalent emissions between now and 2025, between 2026 and 2030, and between 2031 and 2035 that would be consistent with those domestic targets and international obligations? 
to do its work, the Commission obviously has to think about where we are today and the trajectory we believe we're on in the absence of any other action. Because if we think we're on the right path to achieve those targets and meet our international obligations, then there is little more advice to do except to monitor progress and make sure we remain on track. The early work of the Commission makes it pretty clear that we are not on that track, that we will need to have a plan, an emissions reduction plan, that will provide advice to the government on the direction of policy needed to put us on that path. That emissions reduction plan is, in my view, where all the action is. Budgets are budgets. Plans are what we need to do. The Commission will, on the 1st of February, present for public consultation New Zealand's first set of emissions budgets and the emission reduction plan. Put it in your diary. Make time. The plan is only going to be as good as the evidence it's based on, and that is informed by frontline actors who have their feet in the mud and have their hands on the tools. For six weeks, we'll be open for public consultation and then we'll gather that feedback, amend, I'm sure, our advice and present final advice to the government on the 31st of May next year. The government will have 20 working days to reflect on that advice before it must be made public. And the government will have until the 31st of December to settle and adopt emissions reduction plans consistent with its adopted emissions budgets. When it comes to New Zealand's emissions, the agricultural sector has been in the limelight as playing a significant part through biogenic methane emissions. But let's set agriculture to one side. For the moment, let's consider the other half of all our emissions. 40% of that half essentially arises from transport. What we own, what we operate, how we get from here to there. We are not going to meet our targets and obligations unless we have a transformation of mobility. More active mobility, more safe places to walk, to work and school, more safe places to ride, to work and school more lower intensity, lower emitting modes of transport per kilometre travelled, more public transport, more e-mobility, and significantly less internal combustion engines, whether they be in buses or whether they be in cars driven for profit or cars owned for personal use. The decarbonisation of mobility is non-negotiable. The issues we need to address are how we do it, how we do it in a way that is inclusive, particularly of the most vulnerable members of our society, and how we do it at pace. Part of it is clearly about making sure that there is a network for e-mobility charging, but that is a small part of the gains that have to be made. We need the infrastructure to support choices, good choices that New Zealanders will make about where they live and work and how they get around. Your sector has a significant part to play in finding those solutions that New Zealand can afford and must adopt. In the energy sector, we also have to make significant investments and in transformational change. The government has committed itself to 100% renewable electricity. The thing to remember is that only 40% of all New Zealand's energy consumed is produced from renewable sources. And the decarbonisation of energy production along with electricity generation is critical. We may not quite achieve our electricity target of 100% renewable, but it is absolutely essential 
that we have a significant and rapid increase in the proportion of all energy which is generated from renewable sources. Again, your sector has a significant part to play in creating the plans and implementing the plans that will give New Zealand what it must have, which is sustainable sources of renewable energy to power a thriving, climate resilient, low emissions future. When it comes to putting its work together, the Commission is building a reference case. The what happens if all that we do is the policies that are in place given the circumstances we start in today? That reference case is the one that says we're not going to be on track. We then think about scenarios because there is a high degree of uncertainty about the decade that lies ahead. But we think there are two big drivers to put us on the right track. The first is about technology. Are we able to assume that technology will break in our favour? That new advances in technology will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and agriculture and energy production? Will the built environment enable energy efficiency to give us some of the gains sooner? Or will we discover that technology is harder than we think, more expensive and slower to develop and holds us back from meeting our needed change? The second dimension is around behaviour change. Do we assume that we are living in a world where behaviours change rapidly? People are willing to embrace new and different ways of working, new and different products and services in our everyday lives? Or do we assume that behaviour change is slower than we might expect. We hang and cling to our fossil-based past as we walk into the future. If technology goes our way and our behaviours change, we call that our tailwind scenario. We find ourselves in a relatively likely place to meet our targets and international obligations. But if we find ourselves with technology not breaking in our favour and our behaviours of reluctant change, our headwind scenario mean more policy action is going to be essential, more interventions and higher prices for carbon than would otherwise be the case. In our work, you will see the assumptions that we are making about the various pathways and the policy actions that would be consistent with those various scenarios. You will be invited to form your own views and make your own contribution before the advice of the Commission is finalised. But the Commission is not idle, the climate waits for no one. So in April this year, knowing that as a result of COVID, there would be significant fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus available, we wrote to Minister James Shaw outlining six principles for spending and investment. That letter is on our website. But let me quickly remind you, because I've come to believe that these six principles can guide private sector investment and spending, not just central government spending and investment. The first of those principles is look at all your spending and investment decisions through a climate change lens. The climate is changing, that is a fact. Secondly, bring forward investment decisions and investing that you will have to make in the coming decade and do it sooner. Do it now while there is underutilized capacity in the economy. Thirdly, Act in partnership. There is no silver bullet, no green cannonball, no single actor alone who is going to address the issues that we need to address. Find partners in central and local government, in the private sector. Find partners in iwi Māori groupings, in the not-for-profit organisations. Leverage the contribution you can make by compounding it with initiatives, actions, and information of others. Fourthly, 
We need to train our labor force for the skills of the 21st century, not the 19th and 20th century, or we will face skill shortages that impede our progress, even if the money is available and we are willing to change. We also make the point that price must be allowed to play its part, whether it's through the pricing of an NZU and the emissions trading scheme, or whether it's the use of incentives and subsidies. The reality is that price must be allowed to play its part, but it can be only a part of what needs to be done. It is apparent that the most vulnerable in our society may be significantly adversely affected if we move from a carbon-based economy to a sustainable but renewable-based economy too rapidly. We need to move rapidly, but we need to be inclusive. And finally, we draw attention to the fact that we do need to think about what we measure. Gross domestic product is a measure of busyness in our economy that has been monetized and is therefore able to be taxed. But there are a number of things that we need to do and we need to measure them and they may not actually add to GDP. If you walk to work instead of buying petrol for your car, GDP is lower than it would otherwise have been. If you choose to reuse old stuff rather than buy new stuff, GDP will be lower than it would otherwise have been. And if through energy efficiency you buy less electricity and burn less gas, GDP will be less than it otherwise would have been. So in your own businesses, think about the dashboard of measures that will help you live in a low emission society, which is coming to you sometime soon. The Commission's work will not, however, finish with its published budgets and emissions reduction plan. We are also tasked to monitor progress against that plan, to review the National Adaptation Plan that will be prepared by the Ministry for the Environment and adopted by the government. And we are also required to give advice on the nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement and whether our nationally determined contribution is consistent with our commitments under the Paris Agreement. There is much work to be done and many opportunities for your sector, industry and participants to contribute. Often young people ask me, what can they do when they're not leaders of business, elected representatives of the people? And I give them four things they can do. The first is every time you buy something, you're voting for that thing to be put back on the shelf. Be a conscious consumer. Whether you're in business, buying through your supply lines, or whether you're a householder, buying from the supermarket. Come to know and understand the carbon footprint of your purchases. Every dollar is a vote. Secondly, talk about it. Be an advocate. Put pressure on your family, your friends, your peers, your business partners to take climate action, to take it now, and to be proud of the action you take. Thirdly, I tell young people to put pressure on their employers, the place of work. They can influence the actions and conduct of their business, their business owners and their managers in ways that are quite profound. And finally, I remind them all that in a democracy, you get the leaders you choose. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you about the work of the Commission and the important agenda for climate action that the world has now signed up for. All of the G7 countries are on board. China is committed to net zero by 2060. Most of the other G7 by 2050. The world is moving, the future is now, climate action is inevitable. Europe.